Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for coming back and watching season two. And wow, look at my look at my guests on the red sofa, Virgil Donati and Thomas Lang. Um, so anyway, Oi. thanks guys for coming Oi. along. Oi. 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 Um, how are you? I feel privileged. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Good. Wonderful. Thomas, wonderful. how are you? Uh, I tried to avoid this whole thing with you here today, <laughs> but Virgil said, "Come on, man. If you're not going, I'm not going." And I had to drag I know. him. Did drag you? him along? Yeah. I have yeah. respect. Support, support. <laughs> well, obviously, we go back a long way, Thomas. I well, got a tool when you, were just, uh, when you were just a little unknown drummer playing with little pop bands back in the UK. That's true. Uh, before you turned into a bigger drummer. A lesser playing in LA unknown. now, is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, guys, on a, on a serious note, although this isn't going to be serious at all, I know. I hope not. Um, over the... Uh, you, you've been tagged, both of you, uh, as being... Um, the super drummers or the top clinicians of our generation, both of you. Um, how do you how do you feel about that tag? Well, personally, being at the top of anything is probably um, something to aspire to. Um, for, for, is it particularly the clinician thing that maybe some people are not too ready to embrace? I don't know. Does that make you a uh, perhaps a technical player rather than a musical player. I don't, you know, they, these are some of the stigmas associated with clinician, mm. but uh, I don't believe so. I think I've played enough music, enough records, enough, uh, you know, on enough records with enough people to uh, have a good balance in my musical life. So it doesn't bother me at all. And I know I'm not a super drummer. Right. So if that's their perception. I think you're a super drummer. <laughs> but I don't no. think so. I'm working on I mean, it. Oh, I'm You're a super guy too, and a super drummer. <laughs> but how do you feel, Thomas? Because you've you've taken well, you know, like Virgil just said, it's it's always a privilege and honor uh, to be at the top of any list, and uh, you know, I um, I I personally cannot take such a title or uh, compliment seriously because my head's in a completely different space. I, I, I do take it as a compliment, compliment and I think it's, it's, it's wonderful and I feel privileged you know, to be in such company with Virgil and named in, you know, with other fantastic drummers in the world. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but I don't see myself as that at all. I don't, just like Virgil, see myself as a super drummer in any kind of way. Um, but it's, uh, I guess it's a wonderful compliment. So. I, I just see myself as an artist, you know, and, you know yeah. an art, fundamental, I think, uh, definition of being an artist is, is, is someone who has a creative um, desire, uh, an imagination, and to fulfill those things, to express it, say, through our medium, which is music or drumming, then you're always, you're always, you're, you're always just so impassioned and, and, and so into it that, of course, you know, I, you know, I, I just struggle every day with, with improvement and, and trying to be better to outdo myself, mm. primarily. And everybody else. Yeah. And everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but you're both... No, it's really a struggle, honestly. Sure. No, no, I this know, is, this is yeah. a serious part of the show. Yes, okay. yeah. It's a struggle with yourself. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. And I love that. I love to be able to get up every day and, and feel, still at my age, passionate about that. Mm -hmm. Still have that fire burning that, oh, gee, I, I need to confront that. I need to. Mm -hmm. it, it never gets easier. Yeah. Trust me. Mm -hmm. But you're and both. I think, sorry, go on, Tom. And the, the essence of that compliment or those kind of lists is exactly that. It describes, I think, our passion for music and drumming um, and to be. Uh, considered a top clinician or teacher or educator, um, I think is a huge compliment. And it, it really sort of describes our passion for improving, for growing, for developing new ideas, and for sharing them with the drumming community. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, we both share the same passion for drums and the same determination and ambition to improve and keep improving, uh, no matter how long we've been playing. And I think uh, we both enjoy sharing and performing. Uh, and I think uh, people do appreciate that. And they, they regard, I think, our passion for music, you know. But I can highly. tell you that it's, it's quickly 
drawing to an end for me. I think I'm starting to tire of it, really. Are you? Oh. I, I, I mean, I, every day I think, wow, when, when am I going to wake up one day and think, oh, you know what, I've just had enough. Oh, yeah. No, that he's, reduced, <laughs> he's reduced his daily routine from 12 to just 11 and a half hours now. <laughs> oh, <he's> done, <laughs> it's been a steep yeah, decline. Yeah, I, I can feel, well, it is, yeah. You know. But on, an, uh, on another note, both of you are multi-instrumentalists, okay? You produce, you write music. Um, do you feel that this is an important part of, of the next generation, if you like, of, of musicians or drummers? Absolutely. I think uh, for not just for drummers, for any musician, I think it's important to know as much as possible about music, about other instruments, especially if you want to write or produce music. I think it's very important. Yeah. I, think, I think anything is possible. You know, there are great, great musicians, uh, drummers at the top of their field who don't know a note of music, mm. can't play another instrument and maybe even have a very limited drumming vocabulary mm. and yet still manage to be very successful and, and very um, enriched by their, uh, their exploits, musical yeah. exploits. So mm. it really can, I think everyone has a story to tell, you know, basically. And, yeah. But I think the more prepared you are, the better the chances are. Mm -hmm. So if you read music, if, you, if your skills can cover, you know, some different areas, if you can you know, uh, produce, if you can do clinics, if you can do gigs, if you can play different genres, it's all going to help you survive as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think you have to wear many hats today in the, in the world of music. Yeah. You have to be a jack of all trades in a way. Uh, and I'm talking about the musical side of things, the creative side, playing, producing, writing, reading, whatever it is, engineering, but also, you know, promoting, marketing, you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. I think which you, have you to be. which, you know, on a serious note, you both are very good at the business side of things, and I think a lot of drummers out there that haven't had the success. The reason I feel that you've created what you are is because of necessity. You, you're very business orientated. Some people get into a band for two years, mm -hmm. band packs up, and they're like, oh, that's it, don't know what to do. Right. Um, coming back to, um, well, let's come back to you, Virgil, because um, we've got a clip here of um, your band. So, um, let, let's take a look at this first, okay? Well, band. that's uh, currently my my band, um, the the U.S. band, because I've expanded in the, in the last year. I've um, experimented with picking up a few different musicians in different territories, which you know, in this in this world of progressive uh, music, call it progressive, call it fusion or a combination. Things are kind of tough out there on the road, and, and to make things work, you really got to watch the budgets and. This year I experimented with uh, using, utilizing some Brazilian musicians in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I went to Russia. Those and, guys were a killer. And mm. the Russian guys were phenomenal. Yeah. But I always, have, I always bring my guitar player, who, okay. who is Brazilian. Yeah. Andre Nieri is phenomenal. He's on the clip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this clip that you saw is from a, a live studio DVD, which we did out here in, in LA okay. um, uh, at, uh, at Drum Channel, actually. Right. And we did that over a year ago now at the end of our first tour. And um, in all reality, I would love to redo it now. <laughs> right. After another year of touring, you know, things have changed. But it, look, it's, 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 it's there the for posterity. Yeah, yeah, so, um, but I'm proud of these guys. You know, there's some, you know, these, these guys are the younger guys. I always love, love to give 
some of the younger up and coming hot shot musicians a chance mm. to to show their skills and their talents because there are some amazing young players and and in this case all these guys are, are just phenomenal and um, I've taken them out on the road Good. on various tours so this is this is a, a release which will be out uh, in the very near future Good. Um, and Thomas, you've yes. been uh, busy, I think again, we may have a clip of your new drum school you, yes. online. So um, let's have a quick look at this. Okay. Told you, best drum school in the world. <laughs> best school on the web. Yeah, yeah, I know. Only the second best educator in, in Rhythm Magazine, though. Oh, you know, God. Uh, I mean, you know. And, Who you was know. third best? Oh, I don't know who the third one was. I don't know. Who was the bottom of the list? No, I was third. Uh, Hang on a minute. some web guy. <laughs> anyway. Guy, British guy with a small web show. I can't remember his name. Anyway, <laughs> Thomas, tell me a little bit about, what, so what's this all about? Well, uh, you know, I am continuing my teaching endeavors online. I've had, you know, obviously, you know, my history of, with the instructional DVDs and books and things, and I had an, an online school uh, for a couple of years, a few years ago, and I decided to um, now uh, do this all by myself, not with a company like uh, a couple of years ago, but do everything in-house, do everything myself, and this is gonna be Thomas Lang's Drum Universe, and we're launching at the end of February. Um, and uh, it's going to be uh, an online school, it's going to be interactive, uh, there's a huge uh, curriculum uh, online, hundreds of exercises and uh, uh, video exchange uh, uh, parts of the school, so you can be totally interactive with me. Um, there's lots of songs to download, play-along tracks, transcriptions and so on and so forth, so it's going to be a, a really well-rounded. And how do you subscribe? You subscribe uh, through the website, thomaslangdrummer.com. Okay. All the information is there. Um, and uh, I hope to see many of you out there online in my school. It'd be great. Cool. Cheers. I'm inspired. Yes. Come on, sign up. Already? Come on. Anything you want to Does he know? get a discount? <laughs> no. Uh, we'll, on, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about no, that. You'll talk about you know, that. You'll talk about that. <laughs> I, um, I think he still owes me. I did the wallpaper in his bedroom the other day. <laughs> okay, so he still owes you for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jill. Uh, right, so uh, the, we've introduced, a, taking a bit of the news out, but we're going to introduce a talking point where hopefully you guys can give some advice or share some insight to, to everybody who chooses to watch this show, which will be everybody anyway. Of course. Um, so my talking point this week, both being people who are actually not born and raised in the US at all, obviously you're originally from Austria and even lived in London for a while and mm -hmm. you're originally from Australia, Virgil. Um, I wondered if you could give some insight to people who are thinking about making that move, whether that's to London or to LA or, you know, even to Germany sort of, you know, thing. Like, what advice would you give to someone who is thinking of making sure they make do the, it for the right reasons and understand the risks involved and what they actually have to do in order to pursue their craft that they love? Who wants to go first? Oh, I'll, I'll try. Uh uh, again, I think it, it, it's really, uh, it's, it comes down to a, a very individual, um, personal program, so to speak, what you choose to do, because it's not easy, either way you look at it, it's a real challenge. You've got to pick up, dig up roots, go and plant them somewhere else, particularly if you're totally unknown. Uh, there's an expense involved, factor number one. Um, there are there are the immigration issues potentially. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, work. Where are you going to work? Where are you going to where are you going to find? How are you going to pursue and, and continue chiseling away at your art while you're trying to probably you know deal with all these other factors that will come into play? Uh, but it's possible. I mean, I did it. 
Uh, Thomas has done it. Um, you know, perhaps we were already slightly established. Although when I came here, I really, you know, I, I had a, a little bit of a reputation through a couple of drumming videos, but that was all. No one really knew me, so it was like starting again. Basically, had to make new friends, make new oh, connections, yeah, yeah, connections, networking. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Going to any club where you felt like you could meet the right people to talk to them. And I hate clubs. <laughs> I hate going to clubs, but I did a little of that. Um, but you know, calls started coming through, and uh, and and the the big advantage for me uh, was that I already had the support of companies. I had some great endorsements, you know, that followed me from Australia, and um, that really helped set me up and endure the initial periods of um, you know just struggle and uh, survival. Would you say that if you can kind of establish yourself where you are, depending on where you are coming from, then like as you said, if they then can follow you, that would be beneficial because again if you make connections in your hometown and then that kind of would spread out naturally and it's sure. social media now but I, I, I don't know if Th Thomas probably you've done I think it twice, he may Thomas. agree with me here but I don't know if it's as important nowadays to well to, I the think need to relocate I, I don't think it's well in reality I think it is still just as important my metaphor is always if you want to be a marine biologist you have to move where there's an ocean if you want to call yourself an astronaut, you got to go to space. You know what I mean? <laughs> and if you want to work in the international music scene, you got to go to space. You got to go to space. space. <laughs> you got to go. I no, got it. You got to go where Get there's out. a beach. That's what I was going to go. Where there's an ocean. Where there's what? An ocean. Oh, okay. there's an ocean. So, no, but uh, seriously, the, uh, the infrastructure does matter. And, you know, if you want to work globally in, in, in the music scene, it will have to be English language music. It's either the UK or the States. Mm really. Mm. Um, otherwise, you're, you're always sort of reduced and limited to certain territories, well, language-wise. Yes. And, uh, and also, in, you know, LA is one of these places. You know, there's London, there's New York, there's Los Angeles. There's only a few places in the world that, that have the right infrastructure that are fertile ground for what we do. And there are hundreds, there's actually thousands of studios in Los Angeles. There's Hollywood here. You know, it's a media mecca, you know, here. So for what we do, this is a great place. And it's the only place in the world that combines the infrastructure for music, entertainment, and so on with the weather. So, uh, you know, for me, it was one of those places that always seemed and looked very attractive. And, after, and I moved to London for the same reasons, for the music and for the infrastructure, for the global reach of the music that's being created in England and London. And the weather. And I wanted to work more internationally. <laughs> Sorry? And, and the, the weather. weather. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. London and weather. Yeah. Well, strangely enough, I, I love London and I love the UK in right. general. And I, I've i even been considering moving there someday. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I really do love that part of the world, even the weather. Well, I, was mm -hmm. I don't say, mind a bit well, of weather. I'm from Melbourne, which is... I'm from Melbourne. Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne's four seasons in one day. It's, it's exactly. <laughs> but I, would, I do miss that a little bit. But I would, I would then ask the question of knowing which, you know, you've listed a few there, Los Angeles, London, New York are like big places to go. How do you then decide, or how did you decide, particularly for you, Thomas, like London was the right thing for that time and then even going I LA was right for this time? Always, I loved English rock and roll music. And it's, you know, it's huge. If in, our, in our culture and music, the Beatles, the Stones, you know, Genesis, whatever it is, English rock music was, you know, from, from Purple to, you know, Led Zeppelin, that had a huge influence on me. So it was clear to me that I wanted to go where this style of music and those ideas and concepts and that approach to making music was born. I wanted to be where, where the music was authentic and real and where that attitude was alive and where it all came from and where it started. It's like a classical, you know, music aficionado and fan would move to Vienna where I'm from, because of Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven and, and Strauss and everybody else. So I moved to, to London for those reasons, and here also for those reasons, partly. I mean, that decision was also uh, influenced and driven by other thoughts and uh, considerations, but music and infrastructure was one of them. And uh, LA is one of those places you do get a call, you know, on a Monday afternoon, and uh, somebody will say, hey, can you be here tomorrow afternoon? You know, can you do the session on Friday or tomorrow morning? Could you do this real quick? So these things do happen, and that's why I said it is important to be in the right, right place at the right time, whereas though, of course, you, you're right what you said, with social media today, it's maybe not as important as it used to be because 
I do a lot of online sessions and, and remote sessions from my studio to, with people yeah. all over I, the world. I think people have an outlet now. You know, they can feel like they're part of it, even if yeah. they're living in Ustaminigorsk mm. uh, in, yes. in uh, Kazakhstan. Wow, say that again. Ustaminigorsk. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, backtracking a little, or some, I picked up on something you said, Thomas. The, um, the other considerations for moving, is this what you're reducing your wife to? Another consideration? <laughs> <laughs> You, you saw right through me, yes. I, well, it could I have got to be honest, that, Virgil. He could have said the reason I moved to LA was because I've known Dolbear for so many years now. I just need to I get, get as far away as possible from Dolbear. I think well, I don't know you well enough yet. I, I, I thought I did, that thought crossed my mind. But you you do want to go in there, yeah. Elizabeth well, better, better, and I thought, I well, know I Elizabeth and she deserves better than consideration. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. She deserves better than me, period. <laughs> well, I think we've got to uh, go to a commercial break. So um, okay. we'll, we'll be back in a minute. The, the badge had to represent what we, what we are and what we do. So it's a combination of ornate, it's, it's an ornate badge. But in the, in, in the badge, there's, there's, a, there's a message to build and excel and to inspire and enhance and that's exactly what you know our drums do. So people would ask what makes a good drum? Well it's, it's everything that makes a good drum and it's the small detail to from, from A to Z, it's, it's the, um, the timber type, it's, it's, the, it's the gluing of the timber, the, the cutting, uh, the lacquer, the edges, the lugs, the heads, um, the hoops, everything goes together and makes that, that product and if it's all good you put, it's like bacon, you get out what you put into it, you know, all the good ingredients, and that, so that's what makes a good drum. Okay, so, show and tell. This is a section within the show where you show us something that uh, has some history, is close to you, has a memory, whatever. So, Thomas. Okay. Um, oh, we're not what going you there, are we? Oh, well, you we're go wherever there. you want. But Sharing come on, Thomas. Memories. Where is it? Share your memories, Thomas. <laughs> okay. I brought my first drum book. Wow. Okay. This is a very classic um, drum, snare drum book. This is from the Wiener Schlagwerkschule, which is in a um, oh, Guinness uh, drum school. Uh, it's a very classy book by uh, an author named Richard Hochreiner. This is called the Kleine Trommelschule, which means a sm uh, snare drum, small drum school. Uh, it's full of the original you know, notes of my teacher and myself. Um, this is a classical snare drum book. And um, obviously, um, you know, I started playing drums in Vienna in a very traditional uh, classical uh, way. And uh, I kept it all these years, you know, it's, it's an interesting book because it starts quite simple on the first page. It's quarter notes and eighth notes and a few rests, but literally on the third it's page so it's start. already like super <laughs> advanced. Wow. It's yeah. an extremely <laughs> steep learning I, curve. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm right, I, I don't really understand German that well, but it yeah. seems like your teacher wrote here, um, go home, practice, and you never may, come back. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <have> <laughs> Don't come back. <laughs> yeah, he wrote a lot of things. No, uh, but it's funny that you say that because what I always liked about this is that on really. every page, yeah, he did. On every page, there's a little comment on the bottom yep. uh, that uh, relates to practicing and playing. Hold up to the camera, Tom, and show yeah. the uh, camera. So, for example, here it says, Leichtspiel, play lightly. But, um, which is not, uh, Heidel, clearly, clearly Heidel, you, you didn't, didn't follow that. No, you didn't. <laughs> never, <laughs> never. You did have exactly. your signature stick at um, that stage. <laughs> pause me to play the rests or play beautifully. Uh, I think you should go back and review some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, no, I should go back and, and, uh, and take these to heart. But this is um, obviously, you know, this is where it all began for me. My first snare drum book. Uh, I had a fantastic teacher uh, when I was five years old. Um, who taught me how to practice before he taught me how to play. Too. And yeah. it was all, and this made a huge difference in my whole playing and practicing career. So, uh, and it was all with this book, you know, in, my, in the first few years of my uh, playing career. And I kept it all these years. It's all worn out and taped together wow. and pieced Brilliant. together still. And it has the original notes in it. Yep. And, um, mm. and there it is. <laughs> We're just going to take eBay. it home. Okay. eBay. <laughs> eBay. So, so what have you got for us, Virgil? Well, Quite interesting, actually. Mm. I never experienced this in my lifetime until literally about a month and a half ago. Have a look at this. 
it's a uh, saturation crash. It's my signature Sabian symbol. Mm. But look at the condition it's in. So, yeah. It's uh, it's all washed out, discoloured. Yeah, salty. you should you should play a really a good a better brand, man. <laughs> <laughs> You have well, choices. Well, that's, that's right. But let me explain what happened. Uh, the very last gig of the year, I was touring with Alan Holdsworth. Okay. We played at the Riviera Maya Jazz Festival just outside Cancun in Mexico. And um, the, it's a beautiful stage. It's right on the beach, ocean right next to us, to our left. Well, the day we performed, uh, it, it, it was just, it was like a hurricane. It, there was so much wind blowing off the ocean. Uh, symbols are constantly just just flailing in the wind, and you know had to sandbag the stands, and it, it was a backline kit. But um, um, so apparently, uh, salt uh, and humid uh, air, ocean air, uh, warning. causes warning. What? What's that? Shitter alert! Bullshitter alert! Oh, that's my phone. What? what? Bullshitter alert! <laughs> Who is it? Who is oh. it? Thomas Lang, you must have buck dialed. <laughs> oh, you think? Thomas Lang. It's on. Guys, have you yeah, not done probably. these shows before? No phones uh -oh. on the show. What's going Sorry on? Sorry about that. Sorry about Sorry. that. Oh, no. I, I did I actually, I, I, did, I, have, I haven't had a chance to really assign my ringtone. <laughs> it was a pro I mean, I thought taken, that ringtone matched perfectly. Don't take it. Right. Shit to alert. Don't take offense. <laughs> Bull, bullshitter alert. Bullshitter uh, alert. Anyway, your show and tell Sorry. then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Interesting that away, uh, so <laughs> Apparently, like I was saying, the salt and humid yep. ocean air uh, can, uh, well, does oxidize metals mm. ten times faster than um, regular humidity. And uh, on that, you know, to make it worse, the uh, tempestuous kind of conditions of that show that I experienced um, obviously caused the... Um, the oxidation of the metal to be profoundly more uh, enhanced. Right. So, therefore, at the end of the uh, at the end of the show, in fact, after sound check, we sound check early in the day. Kit stayed set up backstage. Wind blowing all day. I get to the gig. I go on stage to quickly check the stuff. There's a thin layer of, of salt, salt all over right. the drum head, slimy, wet, mm. slimy salt, and the cymbals. And I thought, oh no. Had to play the show, quickly wiped the drum heads, mm -hmm. played the show, got back to LA, opened the cymbal bag, and boom. Wow. There you have it. Does it's, it sound different? Well, it does. It sounds yeah. different. It's kind of dulled it, and, right. you know, I, I like my cymbals. You know, it's to funny, shimmer I, have one, I have one that's brand new of your Saturation Crashes, and it also sounds completely dull. <laughs> well, I, I, I think the jazz. <laughs> They have an application. <laughs> they have an application. But no, I tell you what, and interestingly though, I love the effect on the ride symbol. So I kept the ride symbol. Right, right. Well, I'm I do, trading all these in though. Uh, yeah. I do know, um, first of all, it's an old thing that some guys do, but Stanton Moore. I'll take that. Stanton Moore still <laughs> to this day gets salt and lemon on his new symbols before he uses any of them and wow. does exactly what he does. I put salt just and lemon on chicken sometimes. <laughs> Okay, right. So, Jill, um, we're going over to you, Jill, because I understand you've got a very special guest. So, um, Jill, let's, um, let's go over to you. Right, now we're going to have a bit of a chat with Brent, which I'm very excited to finally meet you. I know. After the last season of seeing your little videos appear in our show. I know, no, no. It was, it was awesome being on the show this last year. I'm glad that uh, I get to be a part of it this year, too. I know. But so before we be, be going to anything else, I need to ask about this little guy. Oh, little B? Yeah, little B. Little B. Uh, this is a bobblehead that we decided to do for uh, promotional purposes. You know, our uh, our show is a little goofy. Um, you know, I completely make a fool out of myself half the time on the show. So, um, what better way to symbolize that than to have a little bobblehead? Cool. Can can I keep him? Yeah, I brought it for a gift oh, for you guys. Oh, amazing! Yes, I might yes. see if we can get like a mini mic myself to like bubble along with you. <laughs> <laughs> We've already had Carrie King next to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, before we go into your your video that you're for for this first first show of the US series, um, thought we could do a bit about people getting to know you. Uh, so, the first question is, is, what's your actual day job apart from doing obviously Brent's hang? Well, I am the brand manager for Gibraltar Hardware and Artist Relations. So day to day, I am working with artists. Um, 
servicing whatever they may need for their tours, um, uh, looking at new artists to see if you know they would qualify for an endorsement. And um, I'm also working with product development, managing the brand. Um, you know, I just pretty much try to come up with cool stuff to come out with for Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you then get into that job of basically creating cool stuff for Gibraltar? <laughs> well, I've been working in the music industry for probably about 12 years now. And I started at Center Staging, which is a backline company here in Los Angeles. And um, worked there for four to five years. And I met all the reps from all the different companies. And um, I found out there was a position at a Gibraltar and um, I jumped on it as soon as I possibly could. And I've been with the company since 2007. Wow. And um, just really took a liking to building drum racks. And um, it just, it really became like a passion of mine. And I just started coming up with new and crazy different things and we started filming it and I started telling people, okay, so if you wanna do this particular type of setup, here's what the clamp that you need. I did a lot of finger pointing. It was like, literally like I had a, one of those small little old digital cameras. It was like, oh, that was, you know, now we use phones, but um, just a little digital camera going, okay, the GCRA, the GRSMC, <laughs> you know, and, it's, um, and it kind of turned into uh, what we do today. Oh, wow, that's exciting. So with that then, Series two in the US, the first six, six episodes particularly, what have you got lined up for Brent's Hang for season two of Mike Dog Bear Web Show? Well, we're gonna be doing a lot of racks this year. We're gonna do a lot of racks. Um, we're gonna be doing some uh, tips and tricks for rack builders out there. You know, I've, just, I've been building racks for 12 years now and it can be very, uh, a little bit intimidating to a first time rack builder or someone that's not really um, familiar with all the parts so you're like, how do I do? Where do I start? What do I get? And um, it can take a little bit of time to get comfortable with it. But as I've been doing it, I've discovered just little shortcuts about how to, how to level a bar really easily or how to remove the end cap on a bar, how to, um, how to get the height correct, how to, how to get everything stabilized so you can actually create your foundation. And I figured out how to do it really quickly. And I'm gonna give you guys a few tips and tricks on it. We have some artist rack builds that we're going to be doing later on oh, wow. uh, this season. Yes, um, I can't mention everything because they're not completely locked in, <laughs> but we are going to be working with Glenn Sobel okay. uh, for the next Alice Cooper tour. And um, this one is going to be a monster. I'm really excited about this one. And um, I mean, everybody thought the spider rack was cool. This one's going to make it look like, you know, um, Tinker Toy Set. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, we, I know you've got something lined for us up right now for the first episode of the US series, so I'm going to let you go awesome. into that. Thank you so much. We're so glad to finally meet yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very and much. here's Brent's hang. Hey, Mike and Jill. It was great chatting with you, as always. I had to go and slip into something a little bit more comfortable uh, for the shoot. But as you know, I just wanted to show you guys again that Gibraltar is known for working with all brands. We're not just fixed on one. And I'm gonna show you that by using the Stealth Rack. And I'm gonna show you how it works with Pearl, with Yamaha, and with brands that use L-Arms like Tama, DW, Gretsch, PDP. It's all there. So let's have a look. So today we're talking about the GSVMS, which is the Stealth Vertical Mounting System. Now this is just a bare naked rack. There's no mounts, there's no snare baskets. This allows you to use your own tom mounts, your own snare basket to mount to the Stealth Rack. So it comes with three different size nylon bushings to allow you to change tube diameters. A 3 quarter inch, 7 8 inch, and 1 inch. Here I have a 1 up 1 down setup using a Yamaha style mount. Now obviously this is a Gretsch kit with a Gibraltar suspension mount, but I'm using a Yamaha Tom bracket and a Yamaha Tom arm to show how Yamaha fits with the Stealth Rack. So let's talk about our crash symbol. I didn't want to add another symbol stand to the setup because I wanted to keep the, the floor space clean and tidy. The Yamaha Tom arm doesn't come with a symbol mount. So what I did was I used a no leg symbol stand and attached it to the Stealth Rack. This way I was able to keep the floor space clean and I was able to consolidate everything into one. So here we have a five piece setup in an offset configuration. Now I've used a tri mount and attached it to the stealth rack so I can mount my two rack toms and my crash symbol which is now using a mini boom. 
So here's the stealth used in a double bass configuration. I've got two rack toms, two floor toms, and two bass drums. Now I'm using the tri-mount to mount two rack toms to the stealth rack, but there's a third mount available if I wanna add a splash right here because I moved my crash cymbal over to my left hand side because I need to be able to see you guys. Now imagine that this Gretsch kit is a Pearl kit. I've got a Pearl mount on a Gretsch tom. Never ever thought that I would ever be saying that. But I've got the tom arm mounted directly out of the front leg of the rack and I've got a no leg cymbal stand attached to the stealth that's holding my crash. So here's our five piece setup in an offset configuration. Now the tri-mount is being used again in the stealth rack to mount the two rack toms and the cymbal in the back. So here's the stealth used in a double bass configuration. Again, I've got a tri-mount mounting my two rack toms to the stealth rack and there's an extra clamp in the back that's not being used. So if I need to mount a splash, I can do so. Or if I wanna mount another cymbal, I can do so. Maybe a china. So now I'm back to my Gretsch kit and it's mounted the way it was intended to be mounted. Very Gretschy. I've got a single tom arm mounting the rack tom directly right out of the front leg of the stealth rack. And then I've got a no leg cymbal stand mounted directly to the rack that's holding my cymbal. I mean, how much easier can you get? So here we have our five piece set up in an offset configuration now. I've got a double tom mount out of the stealth mounting my two rack toms and the clamp in the back is holding my left crash. So here is the stealth used in a double bass configuration. So we're now into the section, um, use it or lose it. So I'm gonna show you an item and a okay. uh, percussion item that would, would like you to know whether you would use it on a gig. Or... So okay. um, what have we got today, Jill? So what we have is uh, from the Juve, uh, these little shakers if you'd like to mm -hmm. share them around. Now, with, the, with these shakers, uh, the, the Juve, which is the company they're from, was, uh, is actually also a product. It's a, a, like a cajon. Uh, Dion Dublin created the Juve nine years ago. However, mm -hmm. the business itself has been running for the last three years. Um, these shakers actually were used in 2014 for the Hans Zimmer gig that he mm -hmm. did in London. These very shakers? Not these, not those, no, ones. Not those oh. ones. I know, I know. <laughs> I've got those ones though with me. But you know what? These very shakers were used for the Mike Dolbert web show yeah. Yeah. today. So the other, so basically these are a smaller version of the Jube in essence, because yes. the Jube is basically the same shape. Um, they're uh, also being made so that you can join them together. So obviously you've got four individual ones. They right. actually do have different tones mm -hmm. in each shaker as well. Um, but you, they're creating a currently putting out at the moment where you can join them all together so you can have three shakers at once or four mm -hmm. at once. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, um, and I, they are launched, they've launched at NAM this year. Okay. Yeah. I actually was, uh, as, you, as you, Thomas knows, I did the uh, drummers for the Hands in my concerts. And how they, these came about was um, Hands was, we were in rehearsals and Hands wanted a Boring. shaker sound. Let's talk about the shaker <laughs> <laughs> And we came up so. with it. these were the ones he liked the most. Wow. So, and, but, and what, what, what are the inner workings? I mean, what are these ball bearings or beans? Don't, don't or? get technical on me. You know oh, what? Wow. What do you think of them? Though? I'm, I'm going to uh, shoot, okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Use it. And I'll tell you why. I, first of all, I love Dion and I love the dupe. I have a dupe. I use it. It's fantastic. Uh, I use it in the studio a lot. I record with it. It's internally mic'd. It's super easy to use. And you know why I would use these? Not only because they're slinking, they're pretty and everything, but because they're square. Mm. I mean, they're cubes, so mm. they don't roll anywhere. It's fantastic. You know those eggs, mm. a lot of other shakers are round. If you put them down, pick them up really fast, put them down really fast, they they're roll gone. on your percussion table and go well, all yeah, over the place. Oh yeah, they're useful for this the drummer who may be doubling Absolutely. on the drum set. True. And this is great. You can put this down on the drum and play and pick yeah, them up on the drum, very, put them down, look at that, boom. Very good point. But um, can I get a, ve a vegan version with quinoa? That'll I'm sure good. if you have a word of Dion, I'm sure it yeah. makes you one specially. So I you, you guys would say use them. Cube with uh, quinoa and uh, <laughs> polenta. <laughs> so no, I, I just don't. Is, yeah, they should all. I think all four of them sound different. But would you use it, Virgil? Is it something you'd use? I you look if if it would require. Oh, you you see? Broken now. It, it didn't. <laughs> no, it didn't roll away. You were right. Yeah, yeah, it it right there at my feet. Yeah. I could e quickly retrieve it in, yes. in an emergency. But no, I do like them. I, I like the aesthetics of it. Um, I really don't consider myself a percussionist, but if for some overdub or something in the studio, I would, I do like the sound. Okay. Sounds um, great. Cool. I, I, I would say use it. 
Okay, Absolutely. good. Okay, so um, well, we're coming towards the end of the show, but I do want to discuss something that I understand the pair of you are working on together, which is adopting a child. No, sorry. No, yes. no sorry. <laughs> we decided to adopt, adopt a drum Headline monkey. Headline news right there. <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, do you want to talk a little bit about hopefully what we're going to be seeing this year with the pair of you? Sure, absolutely. Sure. Uh, we, um, we are planning to uh, create a, a show together. Uh, DW are um, supporting us in our uh, endeavors here. Uh, this is going to be called uh, working title Drum Sphere right now. Um, we've already rehearsed a little bit and brainstormed ideas. And uh, we're going to create a really interesting, contemporary, high-end, 21st century drumming show and extravaganza. Yeah. For I guess I guess one could probably look at it as the next generation drum clinic or drum event. Oh, okay. Um, you know, the two of us will put our heads together, or we have already, and we're creating music for this. The set will be spe spectacular. It's, yeah. it's called the Sphere because DW are building a sphere out of their hardware, out of their rack hardware, wow. their rack system. So, and the drums will all come off that. Uh, GoPro is also said to be involved, uh, you know, as one of the um, sponsors of the event. So there'll be a lot of GoPro cameras and screens. So it'll be quite, uh, it'll, I think it's going to take the drum event to a, a new wow. kind mm -hmm. of level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been, Thomas and I have started exchanging ideas, musical ideas. Um, I've written a, a piece, like a theme piece called The Sphere, and um, we're putting that together slowly. And a lot of it will be played independently. Some of it where we're, we're just playing off each other, but also uh, quite a bit where we're playing unison parts. And f to this end, we really need to be careful. We need to rehearse things. So yeah. we've started sending each other little short video clips mm -hmm. of some of the more intricate parts so we can look at how we're actually playing the part. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, as an example, I, you know, we have a video uh -huh. of a, a small clip okay. I sent Thomas. Yeah. The, um, yeah. So let's have, well, let's have very, a... Very, and it, it's, a, it's a very slow tempo. Right. And uh, so he has a chance to analyze it and see the move I'm making. It's cross-sticking involved. So, yeah. so here it is. Just we can have a look at that. You know, let's just have a look at this. out there to yep. see, um, you know, how we're going about this and, and what I have to deal with. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Virgil, you know, obviously when he writes a drum part, it's it's always very interesting and, and very uh, deep and complex. So for me uh, to play exactly what he's playing, it's it's essential to be able to see it uh, because of, you know, say, exactly, you know, these cross-sticking moves, etc. We can, you know, just reading it isn't isn't always all the information you need to make it look perfect. So, so can we watch it now? Yeah, then? let's okay, watch it. So let's watch it. <laughs> And so this is um, this is this is the part you just heard. Yeah. And of course, it's slowed down a lot, so you, you know it can be analysed, yeah. and you know you can see. And you know what? Uh, to so it's a very, very simple groove. Very oh, simple. Yeah, really, very really simple. simple. And to explain exactly what's happening here, see all these, you know, really dense notes here and all the complicated stuff. That's all Virgil's part. And those that <laughs> note here in the beginning, that's how I kick the whole thing off. <laughs> and. Uh, I play this no, well, quite loudly, and then Virgil takes over and does all I this. I just like you know, I get, I get bored very easily. I need, I need a challenge. Otherwise, it's like, what's the point? It's well, all being said. Well, done. hopefully, um, I know it's going to be touring in the U.S. 
Um, hopefully we'll get it over to Europe and maybe, now we're going to say it on camera, maybe we should get it at the London Drum Show. Uh, ah. Well, not if you're going to be there or anywhere in London. Yes. Well, <laughs> Virgil, if, if... Well, look, if the price is right, mate, listen, uh, anything's uh, possible. And I'm sure that you, if, if that's all the notes you've got, uh, Thomas has got to play, we could just get anyone in to be fine to do the <laughs> Thomas's yeah. part I in London. That was the whole Jill's show, Jill's going to do it, that's I'll it. I'll okay. do it. I'll fill in for Thomas. Well, right. listen... Thank you. Seriously, you've been great guests. Thank you for kicking off the US um, show. It's our first show. We're at Swing House um, in LA. Um, and all joking aside, you know, you've been great guests. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for everyone involved. And uh, goodbye till show two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.